Good afternoon. I'm standing here with Mayor Turner, of course, Dr. Persh from the city of Houston, Barbie Robinson, our public health director for Harris County, and Mark Sloan, our emergency management coordinator. Mayor Turner, first of all, thank you for, for joining us this morning. And I want to recognize all the folks standing here for their incredible commitment throughout this pandemic. Today we find ourselves in, in a difficult situation. We find ourselves retracing our steps toward the edge of a cliff. It is very conceivable that we could once again be heading toward a public health catastrophe. Once again, our healthcare system is strained by COVID-19. It's straining our staff, it's straining our hospitals, and it's imposing heartbreak and anxiety on so many families in Harris County. Just moments ago, I got off the phone with leaders at the Texas Medical Center and Harris Health, and what they're explaining to me is we're facing a perfect storm, a strained nursing and hospital staff, a more transmissible variant, and limited ability to implement public health interventions at the local level. They're also telling me, these leaders in our hospital systems, that this is no longer a disease of the old. The average age of the patient being admitted into Texas Medical Center hospitals is 20 years younger than it was before. We're now having patients on average in their 40s which means there's people in their 30s and their 20s. The patients are the increase in started They're rushing up. It almost looks like a vertical line. We have to shift that curve again and change those trends. Our Harris Health Public Hospital System is now facing an internal emergency situation. Our emergency rooms are overwhelmed at both Bentob and LBJ hospitals. We have more need for hospital beds than we have staff and beds for the patients. In response, I've ordered the county to raise our COVID-19 threat level from orange to red. Here's what that means. This level signifies severe and uncontrolled spread of COVID-19 in Harris County. That means outbreaks are present and worsening and our public health capacity is strained or exceeded. Now, last time we shifted to red was in June 2020. Our community rallied, and within 14 days, the numbers were trending down instead of up. So we know, we know we can change this. And what I'm asking you, all of you, is to help us change this trajectory once again. We're going to need everybody to do their part. What we need to do is logical and it's quite obvious. Everyone needs to get the vaccine. And if you're not vaccinated, obviously everyone who's eligible, and if you don't have the vaccine, 
you need to avoid all but the most essential interactions. It's the only way out of this. Unvaccinated and vaccinated individuals need to wear their masks. Whether vaccinated or unvaccinated, and this is crucial, do not use our area emergency rooms for routine medical care. Use emergency rooms only for truly life-threatening emergencies. I'm hearing this from both the leaders of our public hospitals as well as our private hospitals. We desperately need to allow space in our emergency rooms. There are virtual care options available. There are clinics available for medical needs that are not life-threatening. The most important piece of all of this that can really make a difference is for people to get the vaccine. Nearly two out of three people of the eligible population in Harris County have had at least one shot. If you're in the minority that has not gotten the shot, you're the reason we're here today. I understand initially some people had questions about the vaccine. I get that. But the evidence right now is very clear. It's safe and it saves lives. If you haven't been vaccinated, your window to protect yourself and your window to protect others is closing. There's a limited window and the reason is that the longer the virus spreads among the unvaccinated population, the greater the risk we all face that variants will evolve and will evade our vaccines. If you're putting off being vaccinated, you are not only gambling with your health and your life, but you're doing that with the health of the rest of the community, including those who have gotten the vaccine. Now, everyone is doing their part. All the folks here are working incredibly hard. Health professionals have been going for 18 months. And I do want to take a moment and thank our health professionals. Part of the reason for the strain is so many of them are burning out, and, but yet so many of them are continuing. And so to you, health professional, and, and to your family, thank you. I know what a strain this has been, and we all recognize how you're keeping our communities going. As a government, we've launched incentive programs and paid public information campaigns. We've mobilized vaccine units deep into every corner of the community. We've stood up scholarship prizes for young people getting the vaccine. We're offering free testing. We've lowered every conceivable barrier to getting vaccines, and we're going to do even more in the coming days. But ultimately, this is in your hands. This is a diverse county with diverse views. This should not be about politics. And regardless of your values, regardless of your personal political beliefs, there is a reason to get vaccinated. If you believe in the U.S. health system, you should get vaccinated because you believe in the expertise of the world's foremost medical experts and the incredible achievement modern medicine has provided us. If you believe in personal responsibility, you should get vaccinated, not because it's mandated by the government to do so, it's not but because you have the choice and you know it's the right thing to do for yourself, for your family, but also for the community around you. If you're someone who's skeptical of government, you don't have to listen to me. Get vaccinated because you acknowledge the incredible role the private sector has played to produce and distribute a vaccine so quickly and reward the entrepreneurship and the risk-taking that brought this cure, this miracle, to the market. If you're a Trump supporter, get the Trump vaccine, something he so proudly touted as part of Operation Warp Speed, something even Sean Hannity now advises you get. If you're a Biden supporter, maybe you've already gotten the vaccine, but take the extra step and reach out to a neighbor, reach out to a friend, reach out to a family member, a colleague, who remain skeptical and tell them where they can find a vaccine and help explain to them how safe and effective and urgent it is. Beyond the obvious need for vaccines is the need for us to band together and these things go hand in hand. 
Raising our thread level is something we never wanted to do again. We made it so far, and we've avoided the worst of this crisis by working together as a community. So let's work together. Let's provide another boost to the economy. Let's prevent things from becoming uh, more and more of a problem. Let's provide a sense of hope to this community. I know history will look back at this time as it has the previous two times our hospitals have come close to being overwhelmed. And history will judge us for how close we stood together to overcome this latest challenge. It's been exhausting, it's been long, but we have a solution. We have a vaccine and we have our resilience as a community. Let's work together and get this done. Thank you. We'll hear from Mayor Turner. Then I'll repeat my remarks in Spanish and everyone will answer questions. Mayor, thank you again. Thank you, thank you, uh, Judge, Dr. Dalgo. Um, <clears throat> I'm pleased to be to stand with you today uh, to highlight the threat that COVID-19 continues to pose on our families and neighbors and standing with you today just to underscore the importance of what we're asking uh, people to do and that is if you haven't been vaccinated to please get vaccinated. If you've gotten the first shot, please go back and get the second shot. Uh, and then encouraging people to put on their, to put on their mask. Uh, the increase in positive COVID-19 cases in our city and county uh, that are linked to the new Delta variant is cause for grave concern and serious action. Uh, the Texas Medical Center uh, for example, uh, just passed 300 plus COVID patients admitted in one day, in one day, which was the peak of the second wave, which was in June and July, if that gives you some, some idea. We can uh, no longer, and, and I'm certainly honored to be standing here with, uh, with Dr. Purse, Dr. Robinson, and with Mark Sloan. Um, well, we can no longer afford to downplay the impact the virus is having uh, or make this even a political issue because it's not, it's a health care crisis. We are here today to remind people that as businesses have opened up and invitations to galas and parties are once again filling up on our calendars, the pandemic is still with us and we cannot let down our guard or stop wearing our face masks. Uh, starting yesterday, you know, I required all City of Houston employees to wear a face mask while working inside city facilities if there is not adequate room for social distancing. As mayor, I have a responsibility uh, to take every possible action to prevent the virus from spreading and to protect the health and well-being of essential workers who provide services daily to the people of our great city. At the close of business yesterday, August 4th, 2021, yesterday, the city of Houston municipal workers, we had 89 positive cases throughout the municipal workforce. To give you some idea, uh, just a week and a half ago, that number was 40. Now that number is 89 positive cases of municipal workers. For Houston police officers, that number is 68. And then for the Houston Fire Department, and these are firefighters, that number is 40. And I will tell you, in the last week and a half, two weeks, these numbers have increased. So you now have, we now have 89 positive cases of municipal workers, 68 Houston police officers, and, six, and 40 uh, Houston firefighters. Three city employees, as of today, are hospitalized dealing with COVID-19. Now, that points out the spread that's taking place in our city, and I will tell you, uh, not only does will that impact these particular employees, but it will it impacts the jobs that they that they are doing, and so the services that are impacted by um, will be impacted in this city. We know that vaccinations are the best way to protect yourself and your loved ones, doing what many doctors are calling the fourth wave of the pandemic, and wearing a mask is another way to slow the spread of the virus, and that is also why I believe it is important. Uh, for us to allow local control, the state to allow local control, uh, especially to our educators, superintendents, board of directors, as, as everyone prepares to go back to school just in a matter of days, if not weeks. Uh, it is important for us to do everything we can 
to protect parents, to protect our children, to protect employees, to protect people who are moving about in this, in this great city. Another fact to consider in the city of Houston about the current threat of COVID-19, the level of, of SARS-CoV-2 in Houston's wastewater, and Dr. Peirce can speak more to this, is 320% higher than the benchmark level of July 6, 2020. That's 320%. This is the highest level since the Houston Health Department started tracking it. That means more people are currently shedding uh, virus in their waste than during the summer surge of 2020 and the winter surge earlier this year. And this is an indication that the virus is rapidly spreading and the increase in cases will likely continue at least for weeks. And therefore, for this weekend, uh, we are putting together the Super Saturday, working with the county. Judge, thank you. Uh, thank you to the health department of the county, to the city of Houston, Dr. Purse, uh, to uh, 12 uh, school districts across the city and the county, uh, putting together uh, this Super Saturday, encouraging people uh, to come and get their, get their vaccine. And what I would say to people, be more scared of the virus than of the vaccine, uh, because this virus is no joke. And currently in the city of Houston, 54.3% of Houstonians age 12 and above have been fully vaccinated, uh, but we need a lot more. We do need a lot more. And I agree with Judge Odago. Those who are unvaccinated are now impacting all of us. Okay. And so, again, uh, let me encourage you as well to get vaccinated. Uh, let me also encourage people to wear their masks. And then let me underscore that we are all in this together. But if we work together, uh, we can uh, turn this thing around and get back on a pretty good course. So thank you, Judge. It's good to be with you again today. Thank you very much. Let me repeat briefly in Spanish. Primero agradecer al, al alcalde y la directora Barbie Robinson, el doctor Peirce y Mark Sloan aquí todos eh, apoyando nuestros esfuerzos. Hoy día es, estamos nuevamente en un camino hacia el borde de un precipicio, básicamente. Es muy posible que una vez más nos acerquemos a una catástrofe de salud pública. Nuevamente, nuestro sistema hospitalario se está, está siendo afectado por el virus. Hay espacio limitado, las salas de emergencia tienen espacio limitado, nuestro personal de hospital está exhausto. Y hay, hay angustia en la comunidad por las por tantas personas que se ven hospitalizadas o que están perdiendo su vida por este virus. Hace solo unos minutos estuve hablando por teléfono con líderes en nuestro centro médico de Texas, el centro médico más grande del mundo. Y hablando con líderes de nuestro sistema hospitalario público, el sistema Hearth Health. Me avisan que estamos enfrentando una tormenta perfecta un personal hospitalario y de enfermería sobrecargado, una variante más transmisible y una capacidad limitada para implementar intervenciones de salud pública al nivel local. También me dicen que esta ya no es enfermedad de las personas mayores. El promedio de edad de los pacientes ingresados a los hospitales en el centro médico son 40 años, alrededor de 40 años. Eso significa que hay pacientes de, de, de 20 30. Este es un virus que está afectando a todo el mundo. En, el, en este momento, todos los indicadores que observamos para medir la, el, qué tan grave está la situación se están moviendo rápidamente a la dirección equivocada. Los números son increíblemente altos. Nuestros casos y hospitalizaciones están incrementando de una manera casi vertical. Es una tasa de incremento a veces la más alta que hemos visto en toda la pandemia. La tasa de positividad, por ejemplo, se ha triplicado al 15%. Hace solo 22 días estaba bajo el 5%. La tasa de positividad en este momento se está doblando cada 1.8 semanas. Eso es el, la tasa más rápida que hemos visto, el incremento más rápido que hemos visto desde el principio de la pandemia. Y los reportes de las experiencias dentro de los hospitales nos dicen también que esta es una situación urgente. 
hay reportajes de las salas de emergencias llenas, de trabajadores hospitalarios que no dan más y obviamente tantas historias que escuchamos de jóvenes eh, hospitalizados o muriendo. Nuestro sistema público hospitalario está en medio de una situación emergencia. Las salas de emergencia están llenas. Tenemos menos camillas que pacientes, menos enfermeros, menos trabajadores hospitalarios de los que se requieren para poder tratar a todos los pacientes en las UCI de los hospitales públicos. Entonces, en, como reacción a esta situación, estoy ordenando que el condado eleve el sistema, el, el nivel de amenaza de COVID-19, de naranja a rojo. Eso significa que hay un nivel significativo y no controlado de COVID-19 en el condado. Significa que los brotes están presentes y se están empeorando, que la capacidad del sistema público, del sistema hospitalario, está cerca del límite. La última vez que el condado se, se movió, que el nivel de amenaza se elevó de naranja a rojo, fue en junio del 2020. En ese momento la comunidad inmediatamente trabajó todos juntos y en, a, a los 14 días de elevar el nivel de amenaza ya estábamos viendo los números caer. Vamos a necesitar hacer eso nuevamente. Y lo que hay que hacer es lógico y es obvio. Todos deben ponerse la vacuna. Todas las personas elegibles deben vacunarse. Si no tiene la vacuna, necesita eh, intentar no llevar a cabo interacciones no necesarias. Los individuos tanto vacunados como sin vacunar deben utilizar las mascarillas. Tanto vacunados como sin vacunar, esto es importante, no utilice las salas de emergencia a menos, salvo que sea una situación urgente. Las salas de emergencia se están llenando. Hay opciones virtuales en línea, hay muchas clínicas en la comunidad. Entonces, por favor, si es algo que, que no le está eh, poniendo una, en, en su vida en amenaza, entonces no visite las salas de emergencia. Pero lo más importante, la solución más eficaz es ponerse la vacuna. Y de eso también quiero hablar brevemente. Casi dos de cada tres miembros de esta comunidad elegibles a, para recibir la vacuna ya se han puesto al menos una dosis. Si usted es parte de la minoría que no se ha vacunado, usted es la razón por la cual estamos aquí hoy día. Entiendo que inicialmente... Muchas personas tenían preguntas acerca de la vacuna, pero la evidencia ahora ya, tantos meses después, es muy clara. La vacuna es segura, la vacuna salva vidas. Si no se ha vacunado, el tiempo que tiene para, para vacunarse, para protegerse a usted, a su familia y a toda la comunidad, se está cerrando. Esa, ese espacio se está terminando. ¿Por qué? Porque entre más... Esperemos, entre más tiempo pase, con tanto porcentaje de la comunidad sin vacunarse, más sube la probabilidad de que se desarrolle una variante del virus que pueda sobrepasar a nuestras vacunas. Entonces, si usted ha pospuesto la vacunación, no está jugando solo con su salud y su vida, sino con la salud y la vida de la comunidad en general. Nosotros como gobierno seguimos trabajando Quiero darle las gracias a todos los trabajadores médicos que llevan ya 18 meses en esto, a ustedes y a sus familias. Gracias. Entiendo su sacrificio. Entiendo que estamos todos cansados. Toca una vez más trabajar juntos. En cuanto a la vacunación, seguimos lanzando programas de incentivos, campañas de educación pública. Hemos movilizado unidades de vacunas en todos los rincones del condado. Estamos ofreciendo premios de becas para jóvenes que se vacunen. Estamos eh, ofreciendo, bueno, reduciendo todas las barreras imaginables para vacunarse y vamos a hacer todavía más. Pero esto está en manos de cada miembro de la comunidad, independiente de sus valores, independiente de sus creencias personales. Necesitamos que se vacune. Esto no debe ser un tema partidista ni un tema político. Si usted cree en el sistema hospitalario americano, debe vacunarse porque cree 
en la experiencia de estos profesionales expertos a nivel mundial, si cree en la responsabilidad personal de vacunarse, no porque el gobierno se lo requiera, el gobierno no lo requiere, sino porque tiene esa opción y sabe que es la decisión correcta para su familia y para toda la comunidad. Si usted es escéptico del gobierno, no se vacune solo porque yo se lo pido, vacúnese porque entiende, reconoce el increíble papel que ha desempeñado el sector privado en producir y distribuir una vacuna con tanta rapidez, con tanta creatividad. Si usted es un simpatizante de Trump, obtenga la vacuna Trump, que él promocionó con tanto orgullo. Si usted es un simpatizante del presidente Biden, tal vez ya ha recibido la vacuna, pero tome ese paso, pídale a otras personas en su vida, colegas, amigos, familia, que se ponga la vacuna. El elevar el sistema de amenaza no es algo que yo quería hacer nunca más. Hemos llegado hasta aquí, hemos pasado por muchos tiempos difíciles, hemos logrado trabajar juntos en cada ola del virus, hemos logrado evitar las crisis hospitalarias que se han visto en otras comunidades y necesitamos trabajar juntos nuevamente. La historia va a, a, a ver qué hicimos en este momento. Han visto cómo hemos trabajado juntos en el pasado. Hoy día lo que es distinto es que existe la vacuna. Entonces, no se trata solo de tomar precauciones como la mascarilla, se trata de vacunarnos, de tomar ese paso rápidamente antes de que las variantes se extiendan y ya poder salir de esto de una vez por todas, asegurarnos que la economía vaya de su vida permanentemente y, 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 y lograr cambiar la página un poco en este virus. Entonces, es una situación urgente, es una situación trágica, estamos todos muy cansados de esto, pero hay una solución. Ayúdenos, nosotros estamos trabajando por usted, pero los necesitamos. Por favor, póngase la vacuna. Si no se ha vacunado, evite cualquier tipo de reunión porque se está esparciendo mucho este virus. Muchas gracias. We'll take questions. As I said, it's the perfect storm, right? It's not just uh, the, the, the lack of, of hospital staff, the shortage in, in hospital staff. It's not just the large unvaccinated population. It's not just the more transmissible Delta variant. But part of it is also the fact that our hands are tied. A lot of what turned the tide in the past, in previous waves, is that we were able to implement public health recommendations that uh, just prove, have proven to be more effective. But I know there's a lot of conflicting messaging, there's a lot of confusion, so I don't want to talk about what I don't have the ability to do. Um, the truth of the matter is, the best we can do right now, the, the most we have the authority to do right now, is, is what we are doing. And so, you know, we're going to continue to make the most of that and, and really be direct with the community about what we need them to do. Is there a frustration, though, as, as the manager of thousands of employees, that you can't do what you would like to do to keep other employees safe? It does break my heart. You know, every death, every hospitalization, all the stories I hear. I was talking to the medical center leaders about a couple of pregnant women, for example, going through a very hard time right now because of the virus. Uh, young people, children. It's just, it's, it's, it's sad in and of itself, but it's particularly sad because it's preventable. And so, yes, any policy that ties our hands in some ways contributes to this, but so does the decision not to get the vaccine. And so that's where we need everybody to do their part. That's right. I just I think we all want to make, uh, we want to have all the necessary tools at our disposal to combat this, uh, this pandemic and this Delta variant uh, that is impacting so many lives. Um, and uh, certainly at some point, Dr. Peirce can speak to uh, what he just told me today in terms of people being transported out from this area uh, to other places, to other hospitals outside of the state of Texas. 
uh, that points to the severity. Um, but look, the way um, I'm going to be dictated by the numbers and uh, the spread of this of this vaccine, I mean of this uh, pandemic, um, to to have 89 municipal employees uh, uh, that have contracted this virus, uh, 68 uh, police officers, 45 fighters. Um, if those numbers, for example, continue to grow, then that's what will dictate uh, my response as the mayor of the city of Houston. Um, I'll take whatever steps we need to take in order to protect uh, uh, the, the people, uh, my employees, and the people in this city. So let me just let me just leave it there. The numbers will dictate my response, and then we'll deal with the whatever happens after that. But um, I am not going to be constrained uh, uh, by some order. Um, wherever this virus goes, and whatever we need to do to check it and to save lives is what I'm prepared to do and, and will do. Dr. First, you want to share? Thank you, Judge Hidalgo and Mayor Turner for letting me uh, speak today. And I'd like to recognize uh, Director Robinson from Harris County Public Health and uh, Emergency Management Coordinator Mark Sloan, uh, partners in not in crime, but in hoping to improve the situation of this community. So a number of things that the, the mayor referred to that we talked about. And so I said yesterday at a press conference with the mayor, and I'm going to repeat it again today. And if you are currently unvaccinated in this community, you represent a danger to yourself and others, and in particular your own family members. Now let me s explain what I mean by that. Both the mayor and the judge have referred to the situation of our health care system. The health care system right now is nearly at a breaking point. The hospitalizations, if you go to the web pages, and the TMC has their web page, and I also would ask you to look at setrac.org, S-E-T-R-A-C.org, and that's an, inter, uh, an interactive web page. And you can look at what's happening to the number of patients that are being admitted to hospitals. And the mayor pointed out that in the last 24 hours, over 300 new COVID patients were admitted to hospitals in the Texas Medical Center. That is a 500% increase from a month ago. 500% increase. And when you look at the number of new cases that we've gotten, in the community, it is 2,500% greater than it was a month ago. So think about that for just a moment. If the number of cases have gone up 25% or 2,500%, hospitalizations are going to lag behind that. And they're up 500%. So what's it going to be next week? To reinforce that, when you look at the viral load in the wastewater, we picked July 6, 2020, which was the peak of the first wave since we had the wastewater testing. At that peak, that was arbitrarily set at 100%. That was in, Jan that was in July 6, 2020. In January, the next wave, we peaked at 250%. Two weeks ago, we were at 231%. And last week, we were at 320%. The positivity rate by about two weeks, predict I'm sorry, the wastewater activity by about two weeks predicts what we're going to see in positivity rate, which the judge pointed out has skyrocketed. So the wastewater is still going up. And the positivity rate projects what happens about two weeks later in hospitalizations, which are already skyrocketing. So for the next three weeks or so, I see no relief on what's happening in the emergency department. So what's going, what does that mean? Let's make this a little bit more tangible. As we started, I pulled out my phone, I looked at a, a, a data source that I've got, and as we started this conference at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, the Houston Fire Department, which has 104 ambulances, 26 of them were in hospital emergency departments waiting to offload patients. Four of them have been there for over two hours. An ambulance that's in the emergency department waiting to offload a patient is not available to take the next 911 call. Response times are going to go up. I fear, and I don't want to be a fear monger, but I, and I don't want to be accused of that, but I'm afraid for the fire department when we get to the point where too many of our ambulances are in emergency departments waiting to offload patients because there's no beds available and people are calling 911 and we're, not, we're going to either have a prolonged response time or perhaps none at all. That is foreseeable based on the numbers we're, that I just gave you. We should be able to see that occurring. And the best way out of this is for people to get vaccinated. And when we look at the hospitalizations, depending on which hospital you talk to, between 85 and 95% of the COVID patients that are in the hospital are unvaccinated. 
we know that 99.75, I'm sorry, no, 99.97% of the deaths since January, the COVID deaths in Harris County, were among unvaccinated people. So we've got to do this. And let me remind you of something else. We're talking and we're focusing a lot on COVID patients. You know what's still going on in the community? Heart attacks, strokes, motor vehicle accidents. We've already had to deal with patients that were trying to find a hospital that can take somebody, not even a COVID patient, just somebody with what would normally routinely happen, and there are no beds available. That's why we've got ambulances waiting for hours and hours to offload. And in addition, the mayor pointed out, <clears throat> one of my other hats, I work with SETRAC, and we help facilitate difficult transfers. This weekend, we transferred a patient from the Houston area, do not fall out of your chairs, to North Dakota. I have a family member, my own family member, who was ill in the hospital in Livingston. The closest bed they could find for him was in Austin. And then when they got into the detail about how sick he was, we said, we can't handle that. He's too sick. You know where he is now? He's in Shreveport, Louisiana. So it is real, and it is happening now. The way out of this is vaccination. I apologize if I sound alarmist, but in my world wearing my EMS hat, the crisis is occurring. People out there in their homes who, don't, who feel fine, you may not be able to see it, but if you have a heart attack, or you break your ankle falling down the stairs. It may take a long time to get an ambulance to you, and we're going to have a hard time finding a hospital that's going to be able to take care of you. Thank you. One question for me, and uh, one from the pool as well, is keeping on the, what you're seeing with the wastewater and how bad it could be in a couple of weeks. Are the city and county health departments working with local hospitals on a plan for beds and personnel? And, yeah. and if so, what does that look like? Right yeah, now? so we, we have been. And actually, you know, the county took the lead on, on getting uh, resources to have that, the thing that we had out at NRG for a while. Thank God we didn't need it. So there is talk about how to do it. Our, but our problem today uh, is, is the nursing shortage, quite honestly. In fact, we have hospitals in the region that have got, they've got physical beds, but they don't have the nurses to staff them. We have other hospitals that have taken the recovery room and clinics and converted them into patient rooms because they were able to find nurses to do it. So all the hospitals are pulling out all the stops. But if we look at an alternative, an alternate care site, um, a field hospital, whatever you want to call it, right now our limiting, our rate limiting step appears to be uh, nursing, quite honestly. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, right after that is going to be physician staffing and respiratory therapists. But right now it's the nursing shortage, which is preventing us from being able to do something like that. And we are talking to hospitals. And they are, you know, they are desperate for something like that, but they simply don't have nurses to contribute. One more question from the pool. Will you continue to monitor COVID-19 through wastewater? Can this testing trace which variant is most present and where? And then another station wanted to know specifically about the Delta Plus variant. Yeah. Are you seeing it? Yeah, so not a big surprise. We, we, we do look at that, and it's almost entirely a Delta variant, and it's everywhere. So, okay. Uh, Judge Dalgo, if I may, a couple of questions from the pool. I've got two from KPRC. First one is the Arkansas governor says he regrets banning masks. Of course, we know Governor Abbott is doubling down on not enforcing masks and has said lockdowns are wrong during the pandemic. Uh, they want to know, how are your safety suggestions any good when the state refuses to support you? I, from the beginning of the pandemic, the most difficult thing, every time folks ask me, you know, what has been the toughest, the toughest thing to deal, to deal with has been the mixed messages. And I... I hear that from the community all the time. So you get mixed messages from different levels of government. What I can do, what I, what I have a responsibility to do for the five million people that live in this county is be very clear and very transparent with what's going on um, and with our recommendations. And so as your county judge, as your local official, my recommendation is number one, get the vaccine get the vaccine if you're eligible. Number two, if you, uh, I, regardless of whether you have or don't have the vaccine, wear a mask. Avoid the emergency room unless it's a life-threatening situation. And if you are not vaccinated, you need to avoid unnecessary interactions. Of course it makes it harder to do all this. It makes it harder for the community to rally when all we can do is suggest and encourage. But that's where everybody comes in. Each person in this community is powerful. It's unfair to rely just on that. I mean, the truth of the matter is it is. We don't have a recommendation system for seat belts and parking in handicapped spots and uh, provisions for how we treat uh, emergency vehicles or none of that is suggested. It's a lot easier when there are 
uh, certain rules for the most important, most life-threatening issues. Um, but you know what? As a community, we need to work together. I'll continue to be as clear as possible, and the mayor and I will continue to be in close communication about making sure we do everything we can do. I will add about the emergency shelter and the, the conversation Dr. Peirce was just having is, yes, we are looking into added capacity. Um, the strain always will start in the ICUs, and it's harder to add ICU capacity. But, but that is, there's, there's a couple things that make this wave particularly difficult. You know, the lack of ability for us to enforce any kind of recommendation, the Delta variant, but the nursing shortage is crucial. And the other thing to keep in mind is the non-COVID ICU population is very high. We're seeing in our ICUs pre-pandemic levels of non-COVID patients. And so overall, the, the, these hospitals are strained not just with COVID, but with non-COVID patients as well. More questions from the pool, if I may. Uh, first one is again from KPRC. They say, why should a vaccinated person care about this threat level if they have protection from the vaccine? Many are growing angry with the unvaccinated. They have the attitude that, quote, if they don't want to protect themselves, let them get sick. So why should vaccinated people take your precautions? Yeah, I, I get the frustration. And um, we're, all of us here are vaccinated, I know for a fact. And, and we're, all, we're all wearing a mask and they're not comfortable. Uh, but, you know, as with any issue pretty much you think about, as a community, you know, as a, as a we, we're, we're connected. We're connected to one another. And that's proving to be true with this virus as well. Those who've gotten the vaccine are still at risk of transmitting the disease. The vaccine is working incredibly well, as it should, to keep people from being severely ill, to keep people from being hospitalized, and to keep people from dying. The vaccine is doing that. And, uh, yeah, almost 100 percent of the deaths all this year have been among the unvaccinated. But the real threat is with the variants. And as long as the, vaccine, as, as the virus continues to spread in the community among such high numbers of unvaccinated people, then even those who are vaccinated run the risk that there's going to be a variant that our vaccines cannot sustain. We saw the Delta variant. Now we're seeing Delta Plus. And it's a race against time for the community to get vaccinated before we have a variant we cannot overcome. And so as a vaccinated person, what can you do? Okay, be frustrated for a minute, think you got the vaccine, you thought you were going to be able to give up on your mask, and then, you know, rally, get, get the mask on, work to get your community vaccinated, um, and, 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 and to set that example, because it's, gonna, it's a lot harder for the unvaccinated to wear a mask if, 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 if most people are getting it. But remember... Two thirds, almost two thirds of the eligible population in this county has gotten the va at least one shot of the vaccine. So those who are not getting the vaccine, you have got to join the rest of us and get that vaccine. And from Fox, uh, they wanted to know the impact to city and county libraries, parks, and multi-service centers. They also ask about city and county health clinics, and specifically on that, will there be any changes to how service provi is provided? I think they want to know about capacity limits inside those buildings as well yeah the 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 capacity will shift immediately to libraries uh, we're working with our court system because and and it, it, you know it's connected to the extent that the virus is spreading among the courts uh, jury all of that that adds to the backlog which is a problem for the crime rate so it we have got to get this virus under control and and and, and we're working on that as far as our health systems there is a ripple effect from the increased strain in our hospital system to non-COVID uh, services in our hospitals. At some point, and it's already happening, our public hospitals have to take staff from our public clinics in order to support the, the, the strain in the emergency rooms. And so uh, during the previous waves in the pandemic, we have seen some clinics have to close simply because of the limited capacity and the need for them to shift to more urgent services. So that's why uh, we need to get, get these trends turned around before our health system becomes more and more strained. Clarifying something you said on the question before, so under code red for vaccinated people, because a lot of the guidance is for unvaccinated people, 
What should people who have gotten the vaccine be doing differently now that we are in code red? Now that we are in COVID red, if you have gotten the vaccine, we need you to still wear a mask. That is to set the example to normalize mask wearing again, uh, really for the sake of the unvaccinated. We need you to avoid visiting the emergency room unless it is a life-threatening emergency. And we need you to encourage the people that trust you, the people you know, to go and get the vaccine. Other than that, if you are, if you are vaccinated, as you know, you are protected, you can, you can go about your life. If you are not vaccinated, uh, you need to avoid gatherings and non-essential interactions because you're just as vulnerable to this more transmissible, more dangerous virus that is, that is taking an enormous toll, toll in our community and our hospitals. One more that came in from the pool. Have you seen vaccination rates increase in the last month or so, given the Delta variants? acceleration or more people getting vaccinated and, and getting that warning? Yes, so we are seeing a, a, a good news in that front. We're seeing an increase in, in, in all providers to the vaccine. On the week of, of uh, July 26, there was a 15% increase in vaccination rates in the entire county. There was a 69% increase in vaccination rates the, the week of the July 19th from the previous week. So, you know, where we've been seeing vaccination rates trend down, we are now seeing them trend up. And we need to keep that going, and we need to see bigger increases so that we, we turn that tide in our numbers before it's too late. Um, we are also seeing the share of Hispanic and African American residents uh, in, getting vaccinated increase, which is, which is also very positive and very important because those are two communities that were falling behind in vaccination rates. Thank you.